Right. Um, yeah, so first of all, thank you, of course, to the, uh, the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to speak here. It's, it's very nice to be back here at K2P after a very long time. Um, so the topic I will be talking about today, this incommensurate Kekele spiral order in magic angle graphene, is actually some work that we already did a couple of years ago. I think our paper came out in 2021. And so I've already given a few talks about this topic and I was actually about to uh, move on and start talking about something else. Um, but then there were some recent, um, well, some interesting recent experimental developments, which kind of made it hard for me not to talk about it. So, um, so my apologies to the Moray enthusiasts in the room. I, I, I expect that at least some of you have seen uh, at least one version of this talk before, but you know, given the recent developments, I hope that even for you, there might be something new in the, in the talk. Um, good, so uh, magic angle graphene, uh, of course, uh, there will be some overlap with Andre's talk that we just heard, so I can probably go through this pretty quickly. So we take two layers of graphene, put them on top of each other with this twist, we get this uh, Mari pattern that gives us this approximate super lattice. Um, with, so, so here you see the AA regions, which is where locally the two layers align. And if I put these black dots on these AA regions, they form this nice triangle lattice. And the period of this lattice is much larger than the, the, the period of the, the monolayers. Uh, for low energy electrons, we can plot their uh, energy as a function of you know, momentum in the, in the reduced Brillouin zone and the mini Brillouin zone as a function of this angle. And then something magic happens at this special angle. We get these flat bands isolated from the others, the other more dispersive bands. And the electronic wave functions of these flat band electrons, they are uh, strongly peaked at these AA regions, which is where I put these black dots on the previous slide. So these electrons mostly live on these AA regions. Um, and so how do we get the flat bands? We have to, uh, we start with two decoupled monolayers. Um, and then the interlayered tunneling hybridizes uh, this, the states of the monolayers and we get the flat bands. And we get two sets of flat bands because the interlayered tunneling varies very slowly. So basically the states uh, near the K value in one layer coupled to the, only to the states uh, near the K value in the other layer. So that gives us one set of flat bands. Hybridizing states near the K prime point gives us the other set of flat bands. Um, and these two are interchanged by time reversal because K and K prime get interchanged by time reversal. And at low energies in the flat bands, we have a lot of um, nice emergent uh, symmetries. So basically the charge within each valley is conserved. So on top of the global U1 charge conservation symmetry, we have a valley U1 charge conservation symmetry. Uh, but also one can just rotate spins within one valley and that will also leave the Hamiltonian variant. So we actually have so a total continuous symmetry group, which is U2 cross uh, U2. Um, and then as we zoom in on the flat bands, we see they also have the Dirac cones, which they inherit from the, the monolayers, but now they have a much smaller Dirac velocity. Um, and as Andre already mentioned, to have band insulators, we need to have a filling of uh, nu equals plus minus four, which means that I have to add or remove four electrons per super lattice unit cell to put my Fermi energy here above or below uh, the flat bands. And this factor of four is because I have a valley degeneracy as explained here, and I also have a, a spin degeneracy. Okay, good. And then the reason why we're also excited about this uh, material is that uh, the theorists' expectation that flat bands will give us strong correlation effects was also borne out in experiments. So Pablo Harillo Herrero famously made a transport device containing this magic angle graphene material. And he saw, uh, well, the by now very famous unexpected Phenomena, so insulators where band theory predicts metals and superconducting domes uh, very close to these uh, uh, correlated insulators. Okay, good. So far, my very fast uh, recap of the basics of magic angle graphene. Um, so even though the first part of my talk um, We'll, we'll work towards conclusions which very much agree with Andre's conclusions, or at least a big part of Andre's conclusions. I will start from a different limit. So Andre's heavy fermion picture works in a limit where, um, well, actually, uh, it works in a limit where, you know, this, 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 this gap between the flat bands and the remote bands is small, so you cannot ignore the remote bands. I will start from a different limit where actually 
the, the remote bands are very far away from the flat bands, and so we can really ignore them. And we can reach this situation by tuning a single parameter in the Hamiltonian. And this parameter is basically the strength of the interlayer tunneling, um, which is diagonal in the sublattice. So in this limit, there is still interlayer tunneling, but it always takes the electron from A sublattice to the B sublattice and vice versa. And so in this limit, uh, which is called the chiral limit, the Hamiltonian is completely off diagonal in sublattice, so it anti-commutes with sigma z, the poly z matrix acting on the sublattice indices. Um, and in this limit, at the magic angle, you get exactly flat bands and remote bands which are very far away. And I will argue that this is also a nice limit to set up a theoretical anal analysis of some, um, some, some properties of, this, of the interacting model. Um, in particular, um, there's something, well, this limit has a lot of structure, has a lot of interesting properties. First of all, um, there's a nice basis for these exactly flat bands, these exact zero modes. Um, and this is a basis where the wave functions, the zero modes, the wave functions corresponding to the zero modes are exactly sublattice polarized, which, mean, which means that every uh, wave function exclusively lives on either the A or the B sublattice. And if you choose that basis, then it turns out that all these bands have a churn number, a churn number plus or minus one. And in particular, the churn number of these bands is given by their, their value quantum number times their, this new sublattice quantum number, which is actually only a good quantum number in this chiral limit. But good, in this limit we have it, and it gives us the churn number with this, uh, by this combination. Um, but it doesn't stop there. There's an additional very nice feature, which is that um, both the, um, the, 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 the model, well, actually, if, if you project now the model on the flat bands, which we expect we can do or we're allowed to do because of the, the gap to the remote bands is very big, if we now project our model into the flat band space, uh, we find that our, our model, both the kinetic term, which is now zero, but um, the interaction term, the leading part of it, the biggest part of it, actually has a very big symmetry. It has a U4 cross U4 symmetry. And so basically, we, if we um, divide the flat bands in two sets of four bands, where each set of four bands has either churn plus or minus one, then each U4 corresponds to arbitrary unitary rotations within the set of four bands with the same churn number. And this is a symmetry of the, of the Hamiltonian. And so now people who are familiar with quantum Hall ferromagnetism will, will recognize the situation. So you're in a situation where you have exactly flat bands which have a churn number and um, which have some continuous symmetry. And so we now expect that at integer fillings, we're going to flavor polarize and we're basically going to get some, some ferromagnetism. And indeed, that's true. That's also what comes out of more detailed calculations. So it turns out that there's a lot of things you can actually calculate analytically um, in the chiral limit and close to the chiral limit. And what you find is that indeed at integer fillings, the ground states are just exact slater determinants. They're really just like, for example, at half filling, just pick any of these four bands, completely fill them, and that will be an exact ground state, and it will give you, um, it, will, it will be an insulator as well. And so for most choices, like most choices you will make, like, like for example, more cho choices of, of, of you know, choosing four out of these eight bands and filling those, you will get a state which spontaneously breaks the U4 cross U4 symmetry. So really it is uh, a ferromagnet. Okay, but in this limit, we still have um, a large degeneracy. We, we still have many uh, ferromagnets which we can choose and which, which are all degenerate at these different integer fillings. Um, but now it turns out that if you add back some, some um, small corrections by going away from the chiral limit, so if you add back the dispersion and you add back these smaller terms of the interaction which actually break a part of this U4 cross U4 symmetry, and you treat these perturbatively, they actually um, they give you some, some anisotropies in this U4 cross U4 manifold. And if you work out the details, you find that um, with these additional uh, corrections, with, so with the dispersion and with the deviations from the chiral limit in the interaction, um, you actually select a unique ferromagnetic um, ground state at each, each integer filling. 
And so the result of this calculation is that at the integer filling, so at nu equals minus two, zero, and two, you get the so-called KIVC state. And so this KIVC state is a state which has intervalic coherence, which means that it spontaneously breaks this value one symmetry. So one can think of it as an, uh, an exciton condensate where the excitons carry valley charge. Um, but the state also breaks time reversal and um, on the microscopic atomic scale, one can think about the state as having some staggered magnetization, some staggered orbital magnetization. Um, and that's how you see that it actually breaks time reversal. At the odd integer, filling, at the odd integer fillings, um, the situation is different. So at minus three and plus three in this chiral limit picture, you get quantum anomalous Hall states. And then at plus minus one, you get some combination of an IVC and a quantum anomalous Hall state. But one particularly strong prediction of this formalism is that there's a close combination between the filling and the churn number. And it's basically that the churn number equals the filling mod two. So at even integer fillings, you get an even churn number. At odd integer fillings, you get an odd churn number. And in practice, it, you get zero, churn number zero at the, at the even fillings and uh, churn number one at the odd fillings. Okay, so how does this picture compare to the experiments? Well, first of all, we found a way to very naturally and very robustly get insulators at all the integer fillings. And that, that agrees nicely with experiment because I believe experiments have seen indeed uh, insulators at, at, at all different uh, integer fillings. So that, that's a nice agreement with experiment. However, there's also a few shortcomings. So first of all, um, we find actually that this KIVC at neutrality is by far the strongest of these insulating states. It has the biggest gap. However, in experiment, you often see a semi-metallic uh, semi state at uh, charge neutrality. Also, in, um, in this, this higher limit picture, you get, again, strong insulators at plus or minus one, whereas in experiment, oftentimes, they just see uh, metals, basically, at plus minus one. And then finally, Whenever they, they, uh, uh, well, an, uh, an insulating state is observed at plus or minus three and there's no inversion symmetry breaking from the substrate, then um, this insulator does not show any sign of an anomalous Hall or a quanti quantized anomalous Hall response. So this also does not really agree with the strong coupling picture where, which predicts that you would see a quantum anomalous, quant a quantum anomalous Hall state at plus or minus three. Okay, so how can we now try to fix uh, these, these shortcomings and get a better agreement be between theory and uh, experiments? So one obvious question, one obvious question is whether, you know, maybe your perturbative analysis around the chiral limit just breaks down. But um, actually, Andre's calculations, which are in the, in, in, the, in the opposite limit where you have some larger chiral ratio, they actually agree with like the states they find like are adiabatically um, connected to these, these ferromagnetic states that we find in the chiral limit. And also numerics suggests that um, there's no phase transition as you tune away from the chiral limit. And really these generalized ferromagnets should still be um, the ground states. Although they won't be exact slater determinants anymore, of course. Okay, so that's, that doesn't seem to do the trick. So then as Andre mentioned, there's uh, the strong particle hole asymmetry in experiments, whereas the model we've been using up to now actually is particle hole symmetric. So the phase diagrams we find are always mirror symmetric around the charge neutrality point. Um, so that's not often not the case in experiments. So maybe these missing terms are important. And there's also effects of the substrate. So this HBN substrate, if it's aligned, with graphene induces inversion symmetry breaking, maybe that's important. And then finally, also generically, the samples are strained. This, this is uncontrolled, there's some strain generically present, uh, present in the samples. Um, and actually in this talk, I will argue that indeed strain is very important. So we're gonna focus from now on more or less exclusively on, on the effect of strain. Okay, so why? Why do we focus on strain? Well, first of all, 
strain is ubiquitous in, in STM experiments. You can just see it with the naked eye. Here, these are two um, topographic images obtained in STM. The bright regions are the AA regions. And so you see that these do not form a nice regular triangular lattice. It's clearly distorted. And this is the effect of strain. And so if you, you know, back out what is the amount of strain that you need to put in on, in the monolayers um, to get this deformation, you find it actually, it's actually pretty small. Like normally, like you need a strain magnitude of you know, between 0.1 and 0.7% in the monolayers. And normally in monolayer graphene, we wouldn't really worry about that. But here it turns out such small strains can be important because they actually build up over much larger distances. So this Mari pattern literally is a magnifying glass for the strain. It's very small on the atomic scale, but it then gets magnified, and you see it just with the, with the naked eye on the Mari scale. Okay, so given the fact that strain is there, how do we now add it to our Hamiltonian? Well, it's already known for a long time how, how strain appears in the Hamiltonian of monolayer graphene. Uh, so here is just the Dirac Hamiltonian describing one of the Dirac cones in, in graphene. And so M here is a deformation matrix. So this is just um, telling you how the, 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 the um, Bravid lattice vectors get deformed due to the strain. And from this matrix M and from these coefficients epsilon, which tell us the magnitude of the strain, we can define this vector potential here, this vector potential A, and this vector uh, potential appears in the Dirac Hamiltonian and it causes a shift of the Dirac uh, cones. So this is already uh, known for a long time, so using this knowledge you can now figure out how to add strain to the uh, Bistritz or McDonald model. And if you just uh, use this construction and you take a, one, a value of the strain which is you know, comparable to what is seen in experiment, you find actually drastic uh, uh, change in the flat bands. So on the left here are again the flat bands without the strain, and then here on the right I'm showing the flat bands which you get by adding in the strain, which you know is more or less or of the same order of magnitude as what is observed in the experiment. And you see that the bandwidth of these flat bands is, is really large, uh, much bigger. They're not really flat anymore. Um, so this is clearly a big um, change to the to the spectrum. Okay, so motivated by this, we did a first uh, mean field study. So we looked at all the different integer fillings. So here the plots in the middle are all the different integer fillings. And the, the x-axis, uh, the, 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 sorry, the two axes are strains. The x-axis is strain and the y-axis is the substrate potential. And so for this talk, actually the y-axis is not important, like the substrate potential, I'm just gonna ignore from now on. Um, and I just want you to focus on the x-axis, which is um, tuning the strength of the strain. And let's first uh, zoom in at charge neutrality, so nu equals zero. And so what we find there is that as you crank up the strain, indeed, you very quickly go from the KIVC to a semi-metallic state. And then at all the other integer fillings, you see the same IKS appearing. So actually we find that all the other integer fillings for very small strains, you quickly go from these generalized quantum Hall ferromagnets to this new type of symmetry breaking order, which we call IKS. And it really appears at minus three, minus two, minus one, plus one, plus two, and plus three. So every integer filling away from zero. And importantly, it is gapped here at plus two, it's gapped at minus two, it's also gapped at minus three and plus three. Okay, so what is this IKS order? Let me start by giving you a cartoon picture. So let's look at these AA regions here and look uh, and zoom in on the atomic scale. What you will see in the IKS state is a square root three by square root three calculate pattern. So here I'm showing a, a um, calculate pattern for the bonds, but you would also see a calculate pattern for the charge density and for almost any local observable. Um, and if you would then compare this calculate pattern in this AA region with the calculate pattern here, you would find it's the same. And actually, basically, you would find it in every black circle, in every black AA region, you would find the same pattern. But then if you would move from this AA region to the neighboring one here, which is denoted with a green circle, you would find actually that it's, it's shifted. It's not the same local atomic scale pattern. Then again, if you go from the green to the red, it would again be different. So really what this IKS order is, it's a microscopic 
carbon atom scale calculate pattern, which modulates on the super lattice scale. And so this calculate pattern um, is really in the continuum language. It is a spontaneous breaking of the value one symmetry where actually, and, and so you can associate, um, it's like an X, Y order parameter. You can associate with this value one symmetry breaking and this X, Y order parameter actually forms a spiral. So it's, 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 it's a single Q order where, where basically um, the X, Y order parameter rotates as you move through space. Okay, so the, thing, uh, the IKS breaks translation. It's a finite Q order, but it does have a modified translation symmetry. So more, um, more precisely, I can define this T prime symmetry, which is a combination of regular translation by a, 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 a super lattice uh, vector uh, AI combined with this, um, with this value one rotation. So basically, again, in the XY picture, if I translate and then rotate all my x, y um, vectors or angles, then this is still a symmetry of my, of my system. And because I have this modified translation symmetry, um, on the mean field level, I can still make use of a generalized block theorem. So I can still write my single particle wave functions in this form, where u is the conventional periodic part, but now the plane wave part is a little bit different. But still, um, there is a generalized block theorem that I can use. And there is still uh, a well-defined quantum number which labels the, the um, eigens, um, the quantum numbers of the eigen, um, the, the, qu the quantum numbers of this modified translation symmetry T prime. And so basically, even for this IKS, um, I can still, uh, you know, obtain a mean field band spectrum, even though it breaks translation symmetry. I can still plot a band spectrum using this new um, quantum number K tilde. And so this, of course, means that this IKS order, even though it breaks translation symmetry, um, at the mean field level, it can only be insulating at integer fillings, which is good because um, in the experiment, we, all, we only see integer, uh, well, we mostly see uh, insulators at the integer fillings. Okay, and if we um, now look at the IKS at minus two, so nu equals minus two, we find that this is actually spin unpolarized states but it still has a lot of uh, collective modes. So if we, this, is, this here is an RPA or time-dependent hard refocus calculation of the collective mode spectrum of this IKS state at minus two, and we see actually it has four um, low-lying Goldstone modes here corresponding to the bro these broken symmetry generators, so to the corresponding, uh, to the broken value one symmetry, but then also um, I have three other Goldstone modes corresponding to the broken generators which um, basically rotate the spins in opposite ways in the two valleys. So even though this IKS state is spin and polarized, it actually still, it actually does have a lot of Goldstone modes associated with, uh, with spin fluctuations. And so these, um, these modes will be quenched with a, with a magnetic field. So even though the state is spin and polarized, it will have an entropy which is quenched with an in-plane magnetic field, which is again, seems to be consistent with some of these Pomeranchik papers um, that came out a couple of years ago. Okay, so far I've been showing you mean field results. One can, of course, um, question the validity of a mean field analysis. So we also did DMRG, and the DMRG results we obtained are at nu equals minus three, where we also find IKS in, in hartree fokker mean field theory. And basically, um, what we see here in this figure is the energy of different states found in DMRG as a function of the strain. And so the way we find this trait, uh, these, these different states is by initializing the DMRG in different quantum number sectors. So in each quantum number sector labeled by the valley and the, the spin quantum numbers, the SZ quantum numbers, uh, we can find what is the lowest energy state. And what we see is that as a function of strain, very quickly here, this, this state corresponding to the circle becomes the lowest energy state. And this is indeed, uh, the IKS state. So also in DMRG, we find that IKS wins. Uh, if you put on a very tiny strain, like look, this is very, very small strain here on the x-axis. Um, actually, let me check how I'm doing on time. Five minutes, okay. Um, in that case, let me skip this slide. So this is 
some more details on how we actually identify the IKS in DMRG, but let me skip that. Okay, so um, a short um, summary of, 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 of the IKS and how it compares to experiments. So first of all, we get the semi-metal at neutrality, which is good, so that's seen in experiments. We get metals at plus and minus one, that's good, again, this is seen in experiments. We get the strongest insulators at plus minus two, again, very good, because mostly when insulators are seen in experiments, they're found at plus or minus two. And then finally, the insulator, the IKS at plus or minus three is time reversal symmetric, and so it definitely does not, uh, does not have a, an anomalous Hall response. And again, that agrees nicely with experiment. But of course, the new development, which made me decide to talk about IKS here, is that actually there were some recent experiments which seem to give some striking evidence for uh, IKS order in, in magic and graphene. So in particular, I'm referring to this recent work by the group of uh, Ali Yazdani in Princeton. And let me quickly walk you through uh, what they have observed. So here, what, what I'm showing on the left is a real space, high resolution STM image, um, which is um, centered at one of the AA regions. And so what we're seeing here, this pattern is really on the atomic scale. And then if you zoom in here, and uh, where, they have, where you have the, the, the highest density of states in the AA region, and you, you change the, um, the bias voltage, you see actually that this local pattern changes. And so at high bias voltage, if you just do Fourier transform of this local atomic scale pattern, you just find the Bragg peaks of monolayer graphene. But then as you lower the bias voltage, at some point you see this additional Bragg peaks, which exactly correspond to the calculate pattern, the square root by square root of three um, um, calculate pattern. And then as you further lower the bias voltage, it, it goes away again. Um, okay, so clearly there is a calculate distortion. And this tells us that there is intervalley coherence, but it's not of the KIVC type. Because as I mentioned uh, earlier, the KIVC corresponds to staggered magnetization, and that you would not see in STM. So clearly this is a different type of IVC order, and it's a time reversal symmetric IVC order, and it's, uh, it's the one which corresponds to the, the, the type of IVC order in, in IKS. And the authors of this, uh, this paper from the Yazdani group did a, a further analysis of this uh, Kekulé order. And basically what they did is they looked at different local patches in the super lattice, and for each local patch, they zoomed in on the atomic scale pattern and they Fourier transformed it. And then they looked at the Bragg peaks corresponding to the Kekulé distortion and note that this, these, this, these will give you complex numbers. So these, there also, there's also phases associated with these Bragg peaks. And they tracked how these phases of these Bragg peaks, the, of the Kekulé Bragg peaks, how they changed as they moved this window through the super lattice. And so this gives them um, a sort of more or less local probe of the Kekulé order, and they find that indeed the Kekulé pattern changes dramatically as you move this window through the super lattice, which means that indeed this Kekulé pattern changes on the Moray scale, again uh, a property which is uh, shared or is also, um, which, al which also the IKS state has. And then finally what, we're, what I'm showing here on the top is this is experimental data, and these, these color plots here, they basically show the phases of these Bragg peaks. Well, actually, they, they take some linear combinations of these, these complex numbers to get um, EREPs of the C3 symmetry. Um, but that doesn't matter, really. You can think of them as just like the three different phases of the Bragg peaks, and they plot them in real space. And again, you see that these phases are more or less more aperiodic in one direction, but they clearly change in, in the other direction. So this seems to be indeed some stripey type of order. Um, so it's a single Q order, which, which um, again agrees with the, with the IKS state. And if you compare this experimental data to the, the, the plots you get from just taking a mean field IKS state and, and plotting the analogous uh, phases of these Bragg peaks, you see that it agrees actually remarkably well. It, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's, I think it's really incredible how, how close the resemblance is between the ex actual experimental data and the, the theoretical uh, data. 
Okay, so it seems from this paper that IKS is indeed there in most typical samples at nu, at nu plus minus two. But however, they also, in this paper, they also report on a few samples which are ultra low strain. So the, these samples have a strain which is below 0.1%. So this is really, really, really tiny. And these samples, they don't seem to find IKS, but also not KIVC. So remember at minus two, if the strain is very small from our mean field study, you would expect again uh, KIVC, which would give no calculated distortion in STM because again, it's a staggered uh, magnetization pattern. Um, but in STM, they do seem to find some, um, again, again, some local R3 pattern as they call it, or some calculate pattern, um, but it's, it doesn't seem to have a clear wave vector associated to it. So it doesn't seem to be a spiral type of order as, as, as is the IKS. Um, so, well, actually, this is, so one, one candidate for the states is actually the TIVC, which Andre also mentions. Um, the TIVC is similar, it, it shares features with both KIVC and IKS. The feature it shares with the KIVC is that it's a Q equals zero order. The feature it shares with IKS is that it preserves time reversal and it would give you a calculate pattern which you can see in STM. So it's a plausible candidate for this uh, state in the ultra low strain samples. But um, it's, it has never been predicted in theory and it didn't seem to be a very com uh, competitive state. However, we have this very recent paper which we just put out on the archive where we uh, put forward one possible mechanism for stabilizing the TIVC. And it's actually very simple if you think about it. So um, what we say is that, uh, we just make the obvious statement that um, because phonons, optical phonons would couple, couple to this density modulation, um, if, you have this, if you have this spontaneous density modulation, it will actually lower the energy of the phonon. So if this is a schematic representation of the phonon Hamiltonian, um, then gamma would be uh, the field or, or the spontaneous symmetry, um, the, the order parameter of the TIVC, and it couples as a field to the phonons. So by just then re-diagonalizing the phonon problem, you see that actually a non-zero gamma lowers the phonon energy. Um, and so motivated by this physical picture, we added the phonon, the, the coupling to uh, optical phonons uh, to the model, and we again did some mean field study. And indeed, we find that for um, small strains, but uh, realistic um, electron phonon couplings, we find that we can indeed stabilize uh, a TIVC state um, at minus two. So we, um, our proposal is that, that uh, it's that this state, which is seen in, in the uh, Yazdani experiment, is indeed the TIVC and phonons are important uh, for stabilizing it and making sure that the, the TIVC wins over the KIVC. Okay, so the summary of my talk is basically um, IKS order, incommensurate calculate spiral order, uh, seems to be there in typical samples, where typical means that you just have a very small amount of strain in the sample. It seems to explain a lot. Um, it seems to explain a lot of experimental features, so an obvious question is how much more will it explain? Is it, um, is it necessary to invoke the IKS order to get a good parent state for superconductivity? Um, and and there's, there's all sorts of other questions. And then uh, apparently also uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, the group of Stefan Najperge also reported that there seems to be IKS in the, the tri-layer system. So, um, I'm very much looking forward to, to, to seeing the results. Um, okay, so thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Um, this work that I reported today was done in collaboration um, with all these people here. So in particular, I wanna highlight Eve and Glenn who uh, are both here. And then um, yeah, th this work was done at Oxford together with Steve and Sid and also in collaboration with Mike's group in Berkeley. And then the DMRG was done by Tianle, Sajans, Dan and Johannes. All right, thank you. All right, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, questions? Yeah, so, uh, um, so the IKS at new equals sub minus two, they said it's been unpolarized. Mm -hmm. uh, just to clarify, so, so is it a spin singlet or just spin unpolarized? It's, 
it can be spin singlet, but generically it won't be spin singlet. It can, you can rotate it to another state which is not spin uh, singlet because it breaks the, the spin rotation symmetry where you rotate spins in opposite ways in the two valleys. So it does break spin rotation symmetry. It just doesn't have a magnetic moment. Exactly, yes. Okay, very yeah, good. Well, the, you, can, like, you can rotate it to singlets. It, it, it yeah, no, no, one I understand. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I think it but, depends what Hans is. Sorry? Sure, yeah, this is without Hans. Is. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so so long as there's any Hans interaction. Uh, it, will, it will pin it. Yes. It'll, it'll pin. Yeah. So, so it's not a spin rotation symmetric state. It, it just. Can, yes, yes, that is true. If Hans is the right sign, it is. What? Right, yes, that's true. Yeah. Yes. The phonons, the phonons would actually pin it to be um, not a spin singlet, but uh, the, 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 the valley hoons you get from the Coulomb interaction would want it to be a singlet. So it depends on which of these wins. Yeah. Okay, so, so then, uh, within this IKS, can, uh, in the dope state, uh, there's two-fold Landau fan degeneracy. Is there, is there, uh, that is that, there that comes story? out very nicely, actually. Yeah, I didn't show that, but uh, I think I have some extra slide on that. So, oh, sorry, I'm going back and further. So yeah, at the non of fillings, um, uh, we do find, I don't think, yeah. I don't think I actually showed the experiment uh, or, or, or results, but yeah, we have checked this and we get the correct degeneracies for the land offense. So is there a 10 second answer for why you get the two-fold degeneracy? Um, okay, let me um, recall. I think um, I think it's just a spin, like you still, basically, if you think about it as a singlet, you still still have a spin degeneracy. That's the only degeneracy. If you dope away from minus two, you want the two-fold degeneracy, and it's basically the spin. So it's a spin degeneracy. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Um, yes. yeah. So that requires it to be a spin singlet state. Well, I just I, I, I can just tell you on the top of my head that it's a spin degeneracy. If I assume it to be the singlet state, there'll be some rotated version of that if you if you don't take it to be the singlet state. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to um, maybe comment on the experimental TIVC because I'm just personally very confused about it and I'm wondering if anyone else has comments on it um, because I mean, if you look at the pattern, it seems like it has some Q vector, but it's very small. I don't know how seriously to take that. It also looks like it's C3 breaking, but the strain is really small, but probably not zero. I don't know how to seriously to take that. It also looks like it's C2 breaking, and I don't know how to seriously to take that. But, yeah. Right. No, I mean, uh, I obviously cannot comment because it's not my, I'm not part of the experimental team, but uh, yeah, I would also like to know some more details about that. Yeah, yeah so. Um, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but uh, what is the temperature dependence of the IKS Black Peak in STM? Um, the temperature dependence. Honestly, I I think I won't be able to tell you the answer. Um, I definitely don't have it on my slide, and I don't. But does it show up only below a certain temperature, or is it? How do I know it's a mean field phase? Well, they. Okay, again, this is about the experiments, but um, what I remember from reading the paper is that they do a couple of checks. Devices away from the magic angle don't seem to show any effect of this calculated distortion. It's also like if you put the Fermi level outside of the, if you put it in the remote dispersive bands, it's also not there. So they did a few, you know, sanity checks to see that there's an interaction, uh, it's, a, it's an interaction effect. And okay, I have a short second question. Um, how close is superconductivity to the IKS phase in the phase diagram? Um, well, most samples show strongest superconductivity if you hold dope minus two, so like a slight hold doping uh, away from minus two that, that immediately and, um, gets you into the superconducting dome, the biggest superconducting dome. But do you think that this IKS phase will have any strong constraints on the superconductor? Um, that depends on how how quickly it goes away as you dope. Mm -hmm. um, it's like it could be if you compare it to the you know the high TC materials, it could be like the antiferromagnet it survives if you hold if you electron dope, but it quickly goes away if you hold dope. So I don't know what's in what situation we're in here, whether it will survive or whether it will go away. We I don't know. All right. Thanks. Any other questions?
So you started out by talking about the Cairo model. So are the, all the calculations you did in the Cairo limit? Oh no no definitely okay. not. Definitely yeah, I didn't not. know no, when no, we no, transitioned no. from Cairo model. To no, Cairo. I mean I could have I could have just um, approached my fir the first part of, part of my talk differently by just showing the numerical results, but I didn't do that. I wanted to give you some way of understanding these results from the Cairo limit. But actually, all the numerics and all the calculations are done away from the Cairo limit and actually for a realistic value of the the Cairo ratio. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Thanks for the nice talk. I wanted to ask about uh, follow up on the question about the uh, spin degeneracy of the of this order. If there has to be spin degeneracy, am I correct in understanding that there has to be a spin orbit coupling because these are valid valid valley polarization. All of these are orbital orders and the spin and valley cannot couple in graphene without an emergent spin orbit coupling. Um, definitely in the calculation that we did, there was no, there wasn't any type of spin orbit coupling. Um, mm -hmm. There is no locking of the spin to the valley here. I mean, this is, um, one can still rotate. It's just that the only reason why it does anything on trivial is that you have a superposition of the electron um, being in one valley and the other. So if you just rotate the spin, if, if, the, if it's up here and up, if it's up in both valleys and I can just rotate the spin in one of the valleys, I can clearly Made this into a different state. I did, that's, yeah, so just, this, there's this, no actually this symmetry locking, survives no interaction. Locking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Okay. Thank yeah. you. So I follow up on, on Jen's question. Like coming from the carrier limit where the like exact form of the band wave functions are, are known, right, for these German bands, can the IKS state be kind of understood from that perspective, like analytically? Um, uh, that, that's a good question. Um, I honestly, I don't, I mean, I don't know the exact answer, and, and well, the reason the reason is that there's one step which um, which I didn't show, but like basically I didn't tell you how how we you know um, explain or at least justify where this Q comes from, or like what is the physical picture for the fact that you have a non-zero Q order, and actually to explain the non-zero Q and actually the magnitude of this Q. You don't use the bare bands, but you use these. Um, you use the fact that actually these bands strongly reconstructs as you dope away from um, charge neutrality. And that's also why you don't find IKS at neutrality, because a strong band re reconstruction is necessary. So at neutrality, you don't have that. They just go to semi-metal. But if, as you're at, at, for example, minus two, these bands are, are very, di like the, the interaction renormalized bands are very different from the bare bands. It's actually the properties of these renormalized bands, which uh, they have, they more or less have some type of nesting these the renormalized bands. And so that nesting vector tells you more or less the, what the Q is. But we don't at present, we, at present we don't have any analytical way of calculating how these, these renormalized bands look like. And clearly they will determine and on the details of the interaction. And given that we don't have any, um, yeah, we don't know how these wave, how these um, wave functions look like. So, yeah. But perhaps you could do it with the wave function of the chiral limit. We haven't tried, but yeah. So do I understand that the way you incorporate strain is through a vector potential? That's right, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. So, but this vector potential picture, it, it only applies for states near the direct point, right? Um, I don't, well. Um, well, I don't know, I don't remember to be honest, but if, yeah, if it only holds for states near the arc point, that's fine because that's the only states which are important for this, uh, well, for, for, for these flat bands, basically. I, I thought you'd want to count for states also away from the direct point, if, if you are. Oh, but I'm, 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 so basically in constructing the, 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 the flat bands, only the, the states of the monolayers within some cutoff around the Dirac points are important. Like these are the only states which, which get mixed in the flat bands. All the other states are not important. 
So I'm definitely within that cutoff, it's definitely okay to just um, think about this, this vector potential. So, but this is all on the, 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 the scale of the, the monolayer brain zone that I'm thinking now. Right, okay. Any last questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. And, uh,